to begin this webinar, I want to welcome everybody. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today in this long anticipated interview with Dr. Stephen Porges. My name is Mahal Ahmad, and I am beyond honored and grateful for being in this event with Dr. Stephen Porges and alongside my mentor, Dr. Taysir Hassoun. I will be introducing Dr. Porges and talking a little bit about his background in a second. But first, please let me share a little story about how this webinar came to life. So after the earthquake, like most uh, Syrians living outside Syria, I felt debilitating feelings of helplessness because I wasn't able to be to join in the field and help affected people. So I thought about reaching out to clinicians, researchers and affected and um, uh, clinicians, researchers, and scientists who were pioneer, who are pioneers in the trauma world. And I asked them if they could possibly share some of their knowledge with the seating clinicians. And of course, one of the first scientists that I reached out to was Dr. Porges, who agreed, who responded right away and agreed to dedicate some of his time for to share uh, his wisdom, his knowledge, and his revolutionary work about the polyvagal theory with us Syrian clinicians in this free webinar. Uh, I'm very honored and grateful for that. And even though it has been six months after the earthquake, sadly, we are still stuck in um, crisis response. And trauma have, has been a daily struggle for us. It became a daily theme for us. So I'm full of hope that this webinar is going to contribute so much to our understanding of tra the trauma world, and it's going to add meaning and depth to the therapeutic modalities that us treating cl clinicians are using, using during this very challenging time. Uh, I would like to encourage all of you to submit your notes and questions to the Q&A, because we're planning on taking questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes. Now, Please let me introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Porges. I'm excited to welcome you here, Dr. Stephen Porges. Uh, Dr. Stephen Porges, PhD, is the, of course the developer of the polyvagal theory. He's a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University. He is the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He's a professor and founding, he's a professor of psychiatry in, at the University of North Carolina and professor emeritus at both University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. He first published on the polyvagal theory back in 1994. And since it has became a crucial part of our, our, our understanding of trauma and trauma recovery. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Porges. Well, thank you very much me to Syria. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And we would love to have you one day <laughs> physically to Syria. You'll see, you'll, you'll experience the love from people. I'm sure. That would be a wonderful, wonderful visualization. So I look forward to that. Thank you. Sure, sure. And I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Takir, who had great influence on my professional career and also who's first introduced me and most of you to the polyvagal theory here attendees. Uh, Dr. Taysir Hassoun is a distinguished psychiatrist in Syria, consultant and trainer in the field of mental health. He is a lecturer at the University of Damascus, Faculty of Clinical Psychology. Would Thank you like you. to say Shukran. Shukran. Would you like uh, to yes. Yeah. Marhaban Dr. Steve. Anna Dr. Taysir Hassoun. من سوريا مسرور جدا لكونك معنا لأول مرة وبدي أعبر عن شكر العميق لتلبيتك دعوتنا إلى هذا الوبينار بالترجمة فورا ولا بكمل للآخر مها طيب ربما ليست لديك فكرة وافية عن سوريا وما مررنا به كسوريين منذ أكثر من عقد من الزمن فنحن عانينا حرب مدمرة قتلت مئات الآلاف وشردت الملايين ووصلنا إلى حافة الجوع منذ أكثر من عقد ونحن نعيش حالة من عدم اليقين وغياب في القدرة على التوقع وتهديد الشعور بالأمان وأتى الزلزال المدمر ليكمل مأساة لا تعرف كيف تنتهي في هذه البيئة القاسية أعمل مع مجموعة من العاملين في مساعدة الناس ليتكيفوا مع ظروفهم الاستثنائية وفي هذه الظروف كان مهما أن أجد منهاجا يساعدني على فهم معاناة الناس دون أن أحملهم المزيد من خلال الحكم عليهم أو تحميلهم الشعور بالذنب أو العار وجدت ضالتي في نظرية المبهم العديد 
أولي فيجا الثيوري منذ بداية الحرب تقريبا وما أسرني فعلا هو معرفة الاستجابة الأقدم وهي الإغلاق حيث شكل ذلك لي هدية لا تقدر بثمن أنا الآتي من التعليم الطبي الرسمي الذي علمنا استجابتان ودي ونظير ودي sympathetic and parasympathetic حيث لم تكونا كافيتين لفهم الطيف الواسع من ردود الفعل على التروم. So Dr. Taysir Hassoun basically is welcoming you, welcoming you Dr. Porges. Um, I'm Dr. Taysir Hassoun, psychiatrist from Syria. I'm very pleased that you are here with us today for the first time addressing Syrian audience. Let me express my deepest gratitude for you today to accept for your, for your acceptance. Uh, our invitation to be with us here in this webinar. You're possibly possibly not fully acquainted with the recent situation in Syria and the trying ordeals that we are as a nation undergone for more than a decade now. We have undergone a catastrophic war that claimed lives of hundreds of thousands, thousands and displaced millions, rendering them homeless. The ghost of hunger looms over our country, leaving us grappling with the constant sense of insecurity, uncertainty, and helplessness. To add this, to this distressing scenario, the disastrous earthquake only compounded this human tragedy, leaving us in the face of endless adversity. During uh, this extremely challenging environment, I, I worked alongside with a group of clinicians and first responders to help people adjust to this exceptional circumstances. It was crucial for me to find therapeutic modalities or a scientific background to help me understand the suffering of the people without any sense of judgment and a physiological explanation that freed people from feelings of guilt and shame. I found just that in the polyvagal theory, um, and I was what captivated me in this theory the most was getting to know the most ancient response to threat, which is the shutdown response. Uh, that was like a priceless gift for me. It helped me explain so much beyond my medical training that only talked about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response, which impaired mm. my understanding of the wide spectrum of the trauma. So uh, we thought about um, being creative of how we want to ask you a question, and we wanted to stay away from asking you the least uh, favorite question to you, Dr. Stephen, <laughs> which is, what is the polyvagal theory? So we thought we wanted to discuss the ma main three concepts within the polyvagal theory with adding the Syrian context to it. Uh, so we're going to start with the, the hierarchy. Would you like to ask the question, Dr. Taysir? ما السؤال الأول اللي راح نسأله لستيف لماذا سميت النظرية بنظرية المبهم العديد هل يمكن أن تتحدث إلينا قليلا عن المفارقة المبهمية ونتساءل عما إذا كان يمكن التفصيل قليلا عن الرحلة التطورية التي أوصلتنا إلى ما نحن عليه كبشر so uh, uh, we would like to ask you a question about why why was it called the polyvagal theory, oh. and if you can speak a little bit little bit about the vagal paradox, uh, we're very interested yeah. in that. And we yeah. were wondering if you can speak a little bit about the evolutionary journey uh, of human beings uh, evolving from reptiles to mammals to have uh, sure. to sure. Uh, in fact, just finished a paper, it's online now, um, it's open access, it's called The Vagal Paradox, a polyvagal solution. The real problem came to me in my own research and I was studying high-risk babies, babies in the intensive care unit who were preterm. And the concern, the medical concern was bradycardia and apnea, meaning heart rate got too slow and they stopped breathing. But that was assumed at the time to be vagal and also the positive attributes of uh, vagal activity and heart rate was assumed to be a what I call respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is a respiratory rhythm in heart rate. And the issue was how could the vagus both be the protector giving respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is related to all forms of health risk. If you have a lot of it, it's very good. Um, and how could it be the same mechanism that resulted in literally uh, sudden death uh, how could it be lethal? And I was very confused because what the explanations were, too much of a good thing can be bad. And that doesn't, that wasn't right. So I spent uh, months and months basically studying 
I, the, what I, term I use is I studied all things bagel. I read everything I could find. I was in the, the basement of the National Institute of, of Health Library. I was, you know, blowing dust off of old books, trying to figure out what was going on. And then the solutions to come to me when I started to, I found another discipline, which was comparative neuroanatomy that looked at different species in the autonomic nervous system with the goal of the comparative neuroanatomy was to get a hint on evolution. We'll, we'll learn later that the hint on comparative neuroanatomy is not necessarily a good hint of evolution, but it starts asking questions for you. So the bottom line for me, the solution was that the reason the vagus could both be lethal and protective was really the vagus is just a tube. It's just a, a conduit with more than one wire in it. So and they come from different parts of the brainstem with different functions. And the area of the brainstem called the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus is in the back part of the brainstem. And everyone learns about that because it's in medicine, because it's important to the gut. Uh, and then they learn about the vagus being related to the heart, but they forget to tell the uh, students that vagus coming to the heart is primarily from the ventral area of the brainstem and not the dorsal. And the interesting part of that is that it's unique mammal. It's an evolutionary journey of where cardio heart inhibitory fibers literally move ventrally and they get to the part of the brainstem where they kind of interact with the nerves that regulate the muscles of the face and head. And that is literally, I would say, the insight or secret that polyvagal theory uncovered. It basically said that we use our voice, we use our face to broadcast our physiological state because the vagus going to our heart is linked to the nerves that regulate the muscles of our face and head. From a clinical perspective, what that tells you is that intonation of voice and facial expression is broadcasting the person's physiological state. Now, intuitively, we always have known that when a baby is crying or a person's crying in pain or fear versus a giggle or uh, literally voices that smile at you, intonation. We know how a mother calms a baby through using mm -hmm. a voice, lots of intonation. And that's because we're hardwired to interpret the intonation of sounds as if it were a vagal nerve stimulator. It functionally calms us down. And it, there's answers to that because there are afferent, there's sensory receptors of the vagus throughout that middle ear structure. It's really quite an amazing system. But the secret uh, that was unfolded, I would say the secret that it, it was hidden, it was just not un understood, was mm -hmm. that you really have two different vagal pathways and they have different functions. And they come on differently embryologically, which is really developed. And you can actually mm -hmm. see the migration of these neurons in the brainstem through embryology. And the interesting part of that is that, like the preterm baby that I was studying, didn't have a mature ventral vagus. So I could see the operations of this very primitive defense system. And all that preterm baby was doing was signaling that they were under life threat. And what did their body do? It reacted like a reptile's body would react, uh, which really immobilized, shut down its metabolic demands. But that is not healthy for a mammal. We need lots of oxygen. So that was where it came from. It's very revolutionary, and discovering all those um, functions of the autonomic nervous system and the power of sociality of down regu yeah. regulating those uh, threat the, responses. The interesting part here is that it expands our understanding of what an autonomic nervous system is. So it is also, it, you know, we learn it as those the vagus and other autonomic nerves, but polyvagal theory says you can't separate that from the regulation of the nerves that control the muscles of the face. And, and fortunately, that enables clinicians to understand, and actually parents and, and spouses and friends, to really understand the physiological state of the other. So they're communicating that. And once we learn that, we learn how we can co-regulate because we know what cues the nervous system is really okay. requesting. It's asking cues of intonation and calmness and gesture. It wants, it, wants the other person to broadcast 
that they are basically signals of safety. This leads to an important point I really want to emphasize and start more and more to emphasize. And that is, we live in a world, uh, we're going to talk about even the medical world, that mm -hmm. discounts the importance of feelings. So when we're in education or medicine or even the political climate, our bodily feelings are not respected. Everything has to do with overt decisions, executive behaviors, things that are observable. But what I would try to do is saying feelings are really our autonomic nervous system talking to our conscious brain. And when we feel safe, the autonomic nervous system is telling us that it's in a state that supports health, growth, and restoration. And when we're in a state of threat, it's telling us that the autonomic nervous system is shifted to defense and can't support health, growth, and restoration. And what we want is our through social interaction to send sufficient amount of cues to enable, give permission to that autonomic nervous system to move out of states of threat and move into states of safety. And the consequence is the support of homeostatic function, the support of sociality and health. Definitely, definitely. And that would give us the perfect segue into one of our questions, Dr. Taysir. Uh, do you remember when we talked about the flatness of face? Do you wanna do you wanna bring that up uh, to Dr. Steven? أنا أنا بدي أشرك دكتور ستيف ببعض الملاحظات من من السياق السوري وبدي هيك تعليق عليها وجدنا من ملاحظاتنا السريرية وليس دراج دراسات قائمة على الأدلة يعني إلى إنه خلال السنوات الأولى من الحرب كما على المستوى الكلي أو الجمعي كانت معظم استجابات التهديد اللي اختبر الناس كانت استجابات تعبئة mobilization يعني fight or flee لكن مع استمرار الحرب والعيش تحت التهديد تحت تهديد الاحتياجات اليومية ونضوب الموارد وكذلك أثناء فترة الزلزال وحتى اليوم انزلق الناس أيضا على المستوى الجمعي نحو استجابة الإغلاق أو الاستجابة الافتراقية أو dissociation حابب اسمع تعليق الدكتور ستيف على هذا على هذه الملاحظه ملاحظه ليست مدعومه بادله لكن هي ملاحظه كما عم نشوفها. So Dr. Taysir is um, wants to discuss this uh, clinical observation that uh, they have been witnessing in Syria. It's not a research-based um, observations, but yeah, clinical observation that it indicates that during the first years of war on a macro level, uh, most people were resorting into uh, threat response that was in the sympathetic mobilization, fight or flight during the first years. Mm. But then afterwards, as the war persisted and living under threat became daily struggle, we began to battle with the secrecy, secret, secrecy of basic resources. People moved more towards the shutdown, also on a macro, yeah. macro level, to, towards the yeah. shutdown response and the dissociative responses. And I would, I would add to that, if you walk in the streets of Syria, you would see, you would notice that people have those flat of faces, um, less open postures, and less intonation, intonation of voices uh, yeah. as, a, as a collective, a, on a collective level. Now, I, I, th I think that can be explained. Uh, and what, what we first have to understand is that the fight flight be metabolically costly. So that when we recruit this defensiveness and whether we call it anger or mobilization to deal with threat, it's costly to our bodies. The body basically has a monitoring of how much metabolic output it can do before it gets feed and says, too much for me, I'm shutting down. And what you're seeing is more and more people are, in a sense, words used describe it pretty accurately. They'll use words like, I'm overwhelmed, I'm helpless. It's like, not that I see a pathway, I only had enough energy, I'd get there. It's it's a re it's like resigning that this is this is inevitable and it's it's a predicted by physiology and the i think the question will be not that that is real but what can you do about it and this is and within a polyvagal structured world view 
polyvagal theory basically acknowledges that we are always going to be under threat. But and our nervous system can adaptively deal with that for defined periods of time. But it mm-hmm. needs fine periods of time to be safe with another. It's that other person, other people, the trust that creates called social nourishment mm-hmm. that enables the physiology to move out of defense into a state of trust. And we can call it co-regulation. But what it's doing, it's taking away the demands to defend and saying, I'm safe enough in this environment. But as earthquakes come and, and fighting occurs in streets, uh, the uncertainty takes away even these uh, places that were, in a sense, almost sanctuaries for physiology. So like, uh, you know, temples and mosques you know, historically were basically sanctuaries for people to feel safe enough, but there are other targets as well. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, بدي انتقل على على يعني هيك مكان ثاني بالنظرية البوليفيجال ثيوري وهي نوروسيبشن ادراك العصبي بالنسبة لنا لا يزال الادراك العصبي او النوروسيبشن مفهوم غامض بعض الشيء هل يمكن ان تقدم لنا تعريفا بسيطا لماهية الادراك العصبي وهل الانتروسيبشن يشبه النوروسيبشن so, so we would like to know more about uh, neuroception. It's still a little um, ambiguous term yeah. for us. Uh, if you can please give us a simple definition of what uh, neuroception okay. is, is it in any ways similar to interoception? Related, but not similar. Okay. So okay. A neuroception is basically, think of it, even a startle reaction, a loud noise. A ball going creates a neuroception that triggers a physiological response. That that physiological response is downstream. Uh, the trigger is not a conscious one. You don't know what it is, but your body reacts in threat. It's the interoception from the body is going up to the more conscious brain that is asking for meaning. That's interoception, and that's actually so important because in the period strategy. You don't try to be aware of neuroception because neuroception is below consciousness. You develop your awareness of the body's reaction. So when you were telling me your story about being on the airplane and the, yeah. you were literally focusing on the turbulence, and yeah. that was triggering neuroception. But what I was really saying to you is don't create meaning out of it. Take the experience of the interoception because the turbulence are really functionally not dangerous on an airplane. They occur, but our body reacts as if they're threats. So we can literally uh, use it as a therapeutic uh, neural exercise. We can get our body into, quote, a trigger of fear, and we can now experience it with explore, exploration and wonder and say, wow, what an interesting bodily feeling. Like going on a roller coaster, which is very similar to what you were feeling. Your body has a visceral feeling. The signal goes up. You make an interpretation. But if you can slow up or stop the behavior after the signal, then you have a lot of flexibility. And you start, in a sense, honoring what your body is doing. And our body is a wonderful surveillance system. And it doesn't always know what it's responding to, but it knows it's responding. So our job is to kind of like uh, basically welcome the feelings before we make decisions about what those feelings mean. And that yeah. would provide, would you allow me, Dr. Taisir, to, to indicate that this provide a perfect segue into when we talked about the polyvagal, vagal, how it explained the shutdown response that trauma survival resort to, especially in uh, raped uh, women in cases yeah. of rape and how we can uh, free them and liberate them. Uh, this is the, the world uh, words of Dr. Taisir, how we can free and liberate those tra- uh, rape survivors yeah. from feeling guilt and shame of why mm-hmm. they couldn't resist, why they couldn't fight back, why they couldn't do anything about yeah. it. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting story that you're bringing up. Of course, for me, I basically figured some things out with a theory and really was not, I would say, trauma-informed. Uh, 
but I was mm -hmm. welcomed into the world of trauma, and they said, wow, this theory explains what's going on. And so I started to learn what was going on, and it came to a very simple conclusion that what we needed to do was to change the narrative of the experience. So the narrative is not that of shame or blame, but a narrative of really wonderment about what the body did. And the body immobilized and was in a way heroic, was life-saving. And because if you fight rape, you can often get killed. So the, the issue is the adaptive function was there. The narrative had been corrupted by society. If you don't fight, you're complicit. So the yeah. issue was, now we had to separate this and say, what is my body doing? And my body is doing what its neural its anticipate is the best for me. It's not a conscious decision. And I need to respect what my body does, because if I don't fall to basically these issues of shame, blame, guilt, and that it really resides high up in our brain, when this defense mechanism is low, it's a foundational survival circuit. And the issue is, what do we make? What sense do we make out of these foundational circuits upon which everything else resides? There's you know, higher brain, our emotion, everything, our memories. We need to respect the foundation. Without respecting it, we just have distorted narratives. And you work with people whose narratives have become so distorted that they end up protecting those states of defense, not allowing those states to literally spontaneously dissipate, resolve. هذا آه هذا بي بي بينقلني للسؤال التالي واللي ذكر شوي منه الدكتور ستيف آه اذا كان النوروسبشن يعني بيشتغل تحت الوعي والدماغ بشكل دائم بيحاول يعني يجعل الخبره خبره النوروسبشن منطقيه او مبرره من خلال السرد ناريتيف هل يمكن اعتبار التشوهات المعرفيه شكلا من اشكال سرديه الدماغ لتجربه الادراك العصبي؟ So Dr. Stephen we were smiling because you hit just the right point that we wanted to ask you about. Um uh, Dr. Taisir is asking if neuroception operates under awareness and narrative is required to make it um uh, to make a sense of those um uh, experiences. Um can cognitive distortion be considered a form of narration of those uh, neuroception yeah. experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want to make one other important point. We've been focusing on neuroception of danger and life threat. But mammals, and especially humans, have a neuroception of safety. And that is the intervention portal for therapy. Uh, neuroception of safety is the, what the mother when the baby is crying. It's the intonation of voice, the facial expressivity. And for you, uh, when you talked about listening to the podcasts or webinars, uh, the intonation of my voice to you was triggering a neuroception of safety, accessibility, welcoming, and it's triggered your nervous system to feel calm. And this is what we really have to respect, is that we have this wonderful portal that enables us to literally calm down and we calm down through trusting relationships and this is the whole effect of the mother's intonation of her voice and i basically started to operationalize that and developed an intervention that's called the safe and sound protocol which takes vocal music and amplifies the prosodic features so that the nervous system can't turn it off and to respond to it. Now, the interesting part of neuroception of safety, this is where we get really into the world of trauma. If you come into the world, or let's say into a clinic more or less, with, uh, let's say, severe trauma or complex trauma or developmental trauma, views of safety are not necessarily interpreted as good. They're really, your nervous system, the nervous system of a person with a deep trauma history might get physiologically triggered like you would with skills of safety. And for us, it would not sense the body becomes accessible. But to a person with trauma, that accessibility is vulnerability. So people who have had severe trauma, it's not that they don't want to be hugged. Many of them would love to be hugged and would love relationships. But when they go into proximity with the cues of safety that 
people we spoke to, their bodies recoil. And what they're Definitely. telling you is that there's an association higher up that when the body gets into that state through neuroception, their, their meaning making, the part in the higher brain, it wouldn't allow them to do it. This is where interventions work through models of titration or studying the interoceptive reaction. So mm -hmm. like we're focusing on it, if I understand what my body is doing, mm -hmm. I have wonderment. It's a, it's a journey of exploration. And I learn to literally co-inhabit my own body. Because I'm going to say the body more or less have a, has a mind of its own, and it doesn't always follow the intentional mind. And if there's ever a battle, this is the dial, a sense of dialectic or conflict. Does your intentional brain dominate your, let's say, visceral or your foundational survival brain? Ah, uh -uh. the foundational survival brain is always going to win, and that's why people. You can't tell people. You shouldn't be depressed. You shouldn't be anxious, and you shouldn't. You should just be social. Their body will not allow it to occur. Definitely, definitely. And yeah. Dr. Stacy, do you agree that would lead to the question where you talked about if if neuroception is malleable, is changeable? Like yeah. if it was, uh, uh, you think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the question. نحن النيوروسبشن له عمر محدد ولا يعني هل هو مرتبط مثلا بالاتاتشمنت بيريود للطفل او هو اوسع من هيك يعني بي بي بتكونه دو يو مايند دكتور تيسير اف اي اسك ذوز تو كويشنز توجذر يا وكمان السؤال الثاني اذا كان نحن بعد الصدمه بعد التروما بيصير عندنا بياس تحيز للادراك العصبي وبيصير هذا التحيز نحو اكتشاف وتقييم الاشارات البيئيه على ان تهديد او خطر هل من الممكن انه يتغير ادراكنا العصبي لاحقا نحو يعني يعني نزيل هذا التحيز لصالح الامان او رح نضل عالقين بنفس المكان اللي هو Definitely. So uh, this is a two-part question building on your um, your your notes and um, insights, Dr. Podres. So first, when is neuroception formed? Is it formed during the first stages, the first years of attachment, during the formation of the attachment of parent-child formation? And the second thing, since you talked about severely traumatized people and how their neuroception mm -hmm. is biased toward detecting threat cues from the environment is it uh is it is it possible to change that or are we stuck with basically a, a broken no, no, uh, let's start off the world's out this is an optimistic theory and, okay. and we evolved to be a flexible species so species has always been under threat but the species is flexible so let's start off with uh saying that neuroception is basically hardwired so uh, we can talk about uh, neuroception of threat, which is in virtually every living organism, whether we're talking about cell, cell or even plants. There are defensive behaviors, even in plants, in terms of strategies of how the resource of the, of the plant is transported based upon threat signals. Like if an animal bites a leaf, there's actually a reaction at the level of that leaf. So defense is kind of everywhere. But Mammals have this other type of neuroception, and that had to do with this linkage between the autonomics and the face. So it enabled us to signal our state and also the signal states of trust and safety. That's why we're in. So I think the question really is, is it learned? And if you don't have good experience as a youth, is it now not going to occur? Neuroception is there. The question is, what happens to those visceral feelings from neuroception? What is the next level of association? What's going on, in a sense, the memory structures, the higher parts of our brain? And what happens with trauma and abuse is that the visceral states, which were states of accessibility and welcoming, are now associated with abuse and injury. So it's literally a two-phase response. The phase response starts with, ah, and then it goes like this. 
And if you work with like autistic children or traumatized individuals, you literally see this and then that, uh, where the body starts. Or if you have pets, you if you have a cat or a dog or a rescue woman that has been abused, the tentativeness of responding to the intonation of another person's voice, where the body wants to go there, but the animal says, last time I went to a voice like that, I was injured. In a way, that's what you're getting with the children. The children have a history of associations of being injured by voices and people who were giving them really false signals. So I coined the term uh, 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 faulty neuroception because okay. it's not that the neuroception is wrong, it's the next step. It's the association with that that is that gets the person out. So you, the other part, this is why it's an optimistic model. Your mm -hmm. experience on the airplane tell, told you a lot. It really said that your uh, ability to access a neuroception of safety was affected by your own autonomic state. So if your autonomic state was agitated, meaning the ventral vagus was withdrawn and you're sympathetically activated, even the cues of safety have less balance or less effective. And that's what you were experiencing on the plane. And when we're dealing with clients or students, we can actually, see, or children, or our own spouses, we can see in their face and in their voice, we know how accessible they will be to both positive and negative cues. So okay. sometimes it's helpful to try to create a different type of co-regulatory strategy. And I think you even have this in your list, like dance and movement. So okay. where you, in a sense, create playfulness as a co-regulatory strategy that does not require the person to immobilize or sit still. Because the nervous system, while moving, has much more options of defense than the nervous system that's told to sit down. Oh, for Definitely. you, as an example, on the airplane, you're on the airplane, and if you start feeling bad, you can't get off. You're there. So uh, it's these restraints that we, even in the clinical setting, we're placed on people. And so I want people who work with those who are traumatized to realize that a more flexible platform of therapy might include walking and talking or playing. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. And would that would that work that with people who are stuck and shut down in dissociative states? Well, it, the issue is everything, cues of safety are going to be dampened if you're both in fight flight and if you're in a shutting down state. So mm -hmm. the, the model for this actually comes from a close friend of mine, Peter Levine, who developed mm -hmm. somatic experiencing. And he uses the word, uh, well, it's titration, penulation is what he uses. Basically, mm -hmm. you just use little of the stimulus and then you allow the body to get comfortable with it. So you basically uh, give, give the locus of control to the client. Another uh, very intuitive and insightful therapist is Pat Ogden, and she developed sensory psychomotor therapy. She's also a very good friend. And she shared with me a video and the video was of her and and a client and the client was like this hands were gnarled like this. and she starts to back her chair up and mm -hmm. she backs up and then the hands start to open up the face of the client changes and then the camera uh pans and pat is 30 feet away from the client it's a very big mm -hmm. room and the client that smiles come closer now the issue was she was giving control of the interaction to the client, and the client was saying, two cards, it's giving me a physiological state of threat, and now if you back up, that threat starts to dissipate. So we have to be very attuned to the signals that the clients or, or our kids or our spouses are giving us. They're, they're telling us what their physiological state is. Definitely, definitely. And being sensitive to those signals, it's not easy. It needs practice because during the time we have forgotten how to be attuned to those signals. I, I think, I first of all, I totally agree. And I think not only I, we're, we have actively forgotten because we've been literally uh, brought up in a culture that says behaviors are learned. 
Yes. And behaviors are not reflexive or built into our nervous system. It was this optimistic viewpoint that anyone could be anything. And if you could do that, obviously you're, you were in control of your behavior. But there was something missing in that uh, presentation. And that is there's things that are wired into our nervous system that make us human. And we need to start respecting that and, and understanding how we can navigate with those limitations. We need signals of safety. We need environments that are have reduced sensory activity. We need control over a certain amount of space. That does not mean that we need it all the time, but we need it some of the time. Okay. So I would also say that within your culture now, sleep patterns are really uh, not going to be very good. People aren't sleeping well. Definitely, no, no, no. And we can relate that to after the earthquake. Yeah. <laughs> الثقافي بما فيها الفن والأشياء الأخرى وكل المنتجات الثقافية الإنسانية لعل هذه الثقافة عدلت إشارات الأمام والخطر والتهديد وكفت عن كونها بيولوجية بل أصبحت ثقافية فمثلا قد تلتقي مجموعة مجموعة مهاجرين في مكان مختلف عنها ثقافيا فهي آمنة بين أعضائها لكنها ترسل أو قد ترسل إشارة خطر إلى من هم خارج هذه المجموعة بطريقة اللباس أو المظهر إلى آخره أي أن الإنتاج الثقافي عدل البيولوجي وبالتالي عند تصميم بيئة آمنة لمن يعانون من الصدمات ربما ينبغي الأخذ بعين الاعتبار العوامل الثقافية so building on on your um, uh, notes uh, on the safety cues dr stephen fortress dr stacy is asking that assuming that culture was the product of social engagement platform oh. and that culture might have culture with all of its shape music art uh, norms yeah. and traditions um had modified those safety cues so in a, within a certain a certain group meaning yeah. that safety and threat cues are not only biological but also embedded within our culture hence oh. a culture that sends safety cues to its members might send threat cues to outsiders from other groups and here we have the examples of immigrants or refugees going to other culture uh, who's which basically is safe countries but still um perceiving the, the outside culture as threatening because they're not belonging or um th they might themselves be sending threat cues within their uh, mm. appearance how their physical appearance or even customs um stuff like that mm. um well, so yeah. Well, I was just going to say, let, let's start with the issue of novelty. Novelty mm -hmm. is welcome when we're in safe environments. So novelty becomes part of humor. But mm -hmm. if we are not in safe environments, the novelty is a threat signal. And that starts now dealing with people who are displaced. So they are signals that are just different from expectation, or let's use the term, a violation of expectancy is a metaphor in our nervous system for threat. So we like predictability, and if it violates that, then it's a threat, unless we are in safe environments. Then violation of expectancy becomes fun, uh, surprises, uh, and enjoyable, but you need to feel safe. And that's not going, immigrant populations are not, I mean, in the best of circumstances, they're not wound at the level that their bodies need. Definitely. Definitely. We can answer the question, Maha, that if we are to be able to do this, we can 
So when providing a safe environment for, for such uh, groups, we should take culture uh, into consideration for, for sure. Yeah, oh, right. of course. So it's not merely that another culture is welcoming a displaced culture. The displaced culture needs people of that culture who have already basically adjusted to be part of that welcoming committee. I, I, was, I was at a trauma meeting in New Zealand February. Mm -hmm. And you know, New Zealand's quite a safe and welcoming country and has people from you know broad diversity. And what was interesting about the meeting was that many of the people at that meeting finally felt they were with people like themselves. And that not just the fact that they were studying trauma, but they found people of their same ethnicity and okay. found that that made them feel safe. It was kind of a real interesting thing that we think of diversity as this wonderful uh, welcoming pot, but people with their own tradition are looking for uh, a relationship to people with whom they share a cultural history. And we need to be respectful and make that statement as an, as an American, which is really Americans are literally displaced immigrants. So all of them, which have, I would all accept the Native Americans who have been uh, marginalized, although this was their native land. But mm -hmm. the people who came, like my relatives, came from Europe, they didn't come under the best circumstances. And their treatment when they arrived was not welcoming. It was, you know, uh, it was a, a, I wouldn't say hostile, but certainly mm -hmm. a survival mode. And, you know, as we start stepping through this a few generations, we start mm -hmm. seeing the other word popping up, which we call transgenerational trauma, where we start understanding that we never gave up the trauma of the, the lands from which we were pushed out of or left. So when you start talking about war, displacement of people, earthquakes, you're talking about it impacting on generations. And yeah. this... Society has not come to grips, has not really understood that. It treats people in a very pragmatic way uh, and, and treats it like a resource that you can just move around or display. Unfortunately, yes, yes, no. that's so true. And but the Sharik, Dr. Steve, Babel, Musharakat, and Loda be Beladna. عن السوشيال انجيجمنت او السوشيال او الكوريجوليشن والكوديس ريجوليشن الامثله اللي اللي شفناها بالميدان مثلا بعد الزلزال كان هناك العديد من الملاحظات من احدى المدن المتضرره وهلا اللي حاضرين من حلب بياكدوا لنا هذا الحكي ابلغونا انه العاملين باحد مراكز الايواء حكوا عن حالات من البكاء الجماعي للاطفال خلال الليل بتوقيت متزامن مع توقيت حدوث الزلزال الثاني دون وجود اي خطر حقيقي يعني ما كان في تريجر وقد عزينا ذلك الى اشارات الخوف والتوجس التي يتلقونها من الاهل الذين يعيشون حاله الفلاش باك او الفلاش باكس سو so, um, speaking <تصفيق> Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so uh, through um, observations from the field in Syria, speaking about, about the co-regulation, the social engagement system, uh, we we both experienced um, uh, experiences of co-regulation or and co-disregulation. And the co-disregulation happened in um, experiences like in shelters in one of the biggest cities that was struck by the earthquake. It's called Aleppo. Uh, in, in some of the shelter shelters, uh, people and infants and, and toddlers and infant children in general, they started crying hysterically during the night at the same time the earthquake hit uh, mm. nights before and we were explaining that that the child is uh getting that signal threat signals from the mothers mm. who, who were experiencing flashbacks or they were in defense um or they were receiving threat cues uh related mm. to flashbacks and they were getting both dysregulated and they were crying and they were inconsolable um so we were wondering if you can elaborate on that yeah i i think the explanation is even simpler 
Uh, basically, our autonomic nervous system is very easily conditioned. So this okay. is what's called classical conditioning. This is Pavlovian. And the all of Pavlovian conditioning was based on one principle, and that was called temporal conditioning, time. So, so if the baby is hysterical because the earthquake hit at a certain time, the nervous system is going to start building a template that anticipates that that time is a time of great vulnerability. And that may occur in the mothers as well. And so you start getting the amplification of a feeling of vulnerability. And the consequence of a vulnerable mother near a vulnerable child is uh, hysteric behaviors. Definitely that would be, from that. Yeah, that would be my initial speculation on that. Definitely. Yeah, it's more, it's more simple, simpler. Well, yeah. than I, well, it doesn't take the big brain. I, I have, I thought the earlier question that you were going to ask me was, what would a society be like if it accepted the principles of the social engagement system? I would, I, I would love to hear the answer of that question. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. But I, I thought that was leading to the issue. And the answer is, I would love to see medicine, education, work environments, societies to basically be more in tune with the principles of nervous systems that really uh, thrive under symbols of safety, as opposed to a, a model. And this is the model. Okay, I'm not sure if in Syria you've seen the movie The Matrix. Have you seen that yeah. movie? Definitely. So yeah. I matrix. think the main, the, well, the idea was that we're all living in a kind of a matrix as a computer program, but I think it's only partially right. I think we live in a matrix of threat cues, and that in Syria you can literally visualize and physically experience the threat cues from all sides all the time. The consequence of living in that matrix is that we don't know who we really are because our nervous system is tuned to be protective and defensive so it can't yeah. allow the resources to do what we evolved to do and that is be passion benevolent generous creative spiritual even all these positive attributes of exploration and growth in a, in a creative way are have been minimized because we're under threat and productivity rather than being creative becomes just more of the same you know more products more or more whatever it is as opposed to the qualified ideas and thoughts and the the true pleasure of discovery um, which in a way discovery is like a spiritual experience it is that we feel that we are connected with the minds of the past and the minds of the future it's really it's kind of i'm going to say my, my what i enjoy about my work is that it has continuity with the history of humanity it's it's like understanding sociality has a physiology to it and yeah. if we really tune into that understanding then the social world that we live in be more supportive of humans Definitely, definitely. And we, we, we do have our resources of healing in, in the Syrian traditions, in the Syrian culture. And Dr. Taysir has this wonderful explanation of correlation. لكن كان الناس عم عم تسعى بهذا الخروج للساحات لحتى تكون مع بعض ما تكون من عزل ببيوتة بالإضافة لشيء لاحظناه كمان الناس انتقلت لعند يعني استضافت ناس الناس اللي بالقرى استضافت الناس اللي بالمدن اللي عندها أبنية طابقية وعملوا كوريجوليشن مع بعض كوريجوليشن آمن هذا هذول مثلين كانوا خلال الزلزال طبعا اثناء الحرب كانت الامثله كثيره لكن هي امثله من الزلزال Definitely. And so in this, within the Syrian context, we have many examples of the intuitive co-regulatory uh, behaviors. Um, and especially during the earthquake, people would gather around, would gather in big cities, even though they're gathering in streets between 
buildings, uh, multiple um, uh, stories building. They were still in danger, but they would gather around in the streets. That would give them a sense of safety, and uh, they they did they couldn't bear to go back to their apartments, being in isolation of other people. And people who moved or who moved from those big cities into the countryside who were welcomed by uh, people over there. They were having those social gatherings that they would they they had less of traumatic um, uh, symptoms afterwards. Um, mm because yeah. of the earthquake. And um, I, I want to add to that, um, I don't know if it's relatable, but during the the years of the COVID-19, COVID um, absolutely, yes. So Syrian people, we could not, we could not adhere to the, um, mm -hmm. um, the guidelines, the, the medical guidelines of social distancing or isolation. Yeah. We, we still kept our social gathering. We could not, um there to be in isolation from each other and we had all the mental explanations for why would we would why would we do that uh we said like we had enough with death and war and this um, th this virus is not gonna kill us what's gonna kill us being away from each other um so we had that intuitive um power mm -hmm. or force to be with each other to gather around we have many examples of those co-regulatory behaviors yeah. So during COVID, I, I have I've actually written an editorial that it was a paradoxical system for the nervous system because COVID was a threat. It was a true uh, acknowledgement. But the way we dealt with it was through social isolation. And that was now now where people historically if for humanity, views of safety came from others. And through reality, we mitigated our threat reactions. Now we had threat reactions and people became another threat reaction to us. And so we got retuned. I'd say that even my normal sociality is different. I get exhausted now uh, in social settings where I, I used to just kind of like thrive in them because, you know, it's been close to three years of not having the same social nourishment. Uh, but I want to go back to differences. Mm -hmm. So in in Syria, I presume Syria had very much a Islamic model of the stranger, where the stranger is always welcomed. Whether the stranger is an enemy or not, the stranger is welcomed because that was that was a primary value. And I think that is an important concept that enables a co-regulatory uh, strategy to occur that minimizes uh, distance in terms of political views, psychological views, uh, and, and can actually dampen. You start knowing and liking people. And I think it was embedded, it's embedded in the Islam, Islamic culture. Definitely. Definitely. One of our values was uh, the, the gatherness and welcoming other people and helping other people. And um, but the, unfortunately, trauma, tra relational trauma has been one of the biggest forms that the war has produced in our culture. And that's why we're we're experiencing much relational disruption yeah. more than we like to experience. And technology is not making it easier either. It's, yeah. it's making but, it easier but if, if you if you step back for a, a moment and kind of look down at what's going on and ask what's the physiological state of the people that you're describing, their physiology has shifted into a physiological state of defense. And what that means is that all levels of interaction are now going to be compromised and biased toward reactivity and defensiveness. That was one of the, the main goals or the main messages that we wanted to to, to, to give to our uh, attendees here yeah. and audience, a message of hope that through even our tradition, our culture, we have our intuitive mm -hmm. means of healing yeah. and we need to bring back code regulation into our our um, yeah. daily life. We we need to bring sociality into the healing parts. the The issue is you're not going to give people medicine or injections or drugs, um, or or psychotherapy. They need to have trusting relationships, and that needs to be nourished about how that is developed and okay. you we have to really know what our bodies need and we need to trust others and we can't just go there i'll trust you we have to have the signals going back and forth the co-regulation 
which one body feels safe with another. It's it's a symmetrical and reciprocal relationship. Definitely, definitely. السهرات الاجتماعية وجودنا مع بعض لسه يعني نوعا ما قائمة لسه الحرب ما قضت عليها وهذا شيء جيد. So we still have our rituals that um, that evolve around for regulation and we're still uh, holding on to like morning rituals how if somebody lost a loved one we would gather around we stick around for weeks and even up to a month and we're still holding on to those rituals uh, of yeah. gathering social gatherings and you can even uh, see men gathering around in cafes in the night uh, playing cards and that Gammon and the uh, morning gatherings of women, uh, just like uh, yeah. preparing their food together. We still have those uh, yeah. rituals and traditions, and we're trying to hold on to. Um, Dr. Dr. Taysir, would you? I'm I'm really um, I, I'm interested about hearing the the explanation of uh, compassion fatigue, since we we have been experiencing that a lot in Syria. Would you like to ask a question about that, or do you want me? Yeah. لا بس بدي يعني هيك تعليق بسيط نحن في في عنا صار يعني خلال الفترة الماضية شفنا زيادة كبيرة بالأمراض المزمنة والخطيرة والسرطانات وحتى السكتات الدماغية عند الشباب والموت المفاجئ كمان عند الشباب هل يعني ممكن شرح من البولي فيجا الثيوري لهي الظواهر Definitely. So before getting into the, the the definition of compassion fatigue, and if you can talk a little bit about it, we want to ask you a question that it's very relevant to the Syrian context. During the years of war and after the earthquake and during those years, we have been witnessing a lot of uh, increase in sudden death, death and a lot of um, cases of uh, developing chronic and um, severe Pain. illnesses. Uh, do in the in especially in the youth population, so we would like to know um, a possible explanation for the of the Well, I would say you already know the answer that chronic illness, chronic pain are all basically maximized when bodies are in autonomic states of threat. I mean, there, there's a major autonomic component, and th what you're seeing is that the nervous system is not managing the visceral organs. I want to visualize it that way, that when we're under threat, we are, in a sense, trying to uh, uh, maximize our energy to protect ourselves or to shut down. We're not managing the visceral organs. So now you start getting in medically unexplained symptoms or functional disorders, a lot of gut problems, eczema, um, uh, psoriasis, migraines, uh, but you see it a lot in the gut because the gut gets triggered into defense and that's dorsal vagus. So you see it in the body very clearly and we need to understand what we're seeing. We're not seeing disorders of an organ. We're seeing disorders of a nervous system under a state of threat. And we have to understand that. And that means that you, you can have specific organ damage disorders but in general, there's a mixed set of symptoms that cross many of the organs of the autonomic nervous system. So that, that becomes an important part of seeing. So the real point is that when our bodies are in states of threat, they are no longer uh, optimizing the regulation of bodily organs. So you start seeing all these aspects. The other part of the story is not only is chronic illness peaked, but chronic pain. People have pain. And... Yeah. Uh, pain is neuroception of threat. The body is reacting to, to what it thinks is dangerous. The interesting thing, there's a big difference between acute pain, meaning someone sticks you with a pin, versus chronic pain. They're not the same. Chronic pain is the nervous system being convinced that it's in a state of chronic threat. Acute pain is now something is there. I got to do something with it. So it's reframing. In a way, chronic pain is like trauma. The immediate or the uh, 
uh, threat is not there, but the nervous system is not convinced. Very insightful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the, the word I use is that the nervous system is reluctant to give up its defenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It needs to be needs to be convinced. Would yeah. Would you say the 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 entry to working with those people is is through somatic uh, work through the somatic? Uh, so okay, it, it's a combination of it's a somatic orientation, but mm -hmm. it's a deep respect for neuroception. So okay. you basically, uh, it's somatic because you're respecting that those are affecting the body. And that becomes literally that psychoeducational bridge where neuroception affects the body. You become aware of it through that introception. And that is, I'm going to say, the portal of okay. that pathway to, to becoming healthy. The journey is, is really the aware of the interceptive reaction. Definitely. Yes, very insightful. هلا بدنا بدي اسال عن الكومباشن كومباشن فاتيك نحن خلال ال... يعني نحن الهدف الاساسي من من فهم ال... او تو بي انفورم باي بوليفيجال ثيوري هو انه نشهد ونكون متعاطفين مع الاشخاص اللي عم يمروا ب... بالم هلا ه... هذا الشيء صار حتى متعب لنا صار خطر علينا ف يعني حابين نحكي شوي عن التعاطف او الكومباشن في مقابل الامباثي، هل هن يعني نفس المفهوم ولا مفهومين مختلفين؟ وخاصه بحالات الطوارئ لانه معظمنا هلا بيقول يعني قلبي من الحامض لا والى تشكيلي ببكي لك الى اخره، فنحن بهيك اوضاع كمان تعبنا. ف بدي بدي تعليق من دكتور ستيف عن هذا الموضوع عن الكومباشن فاتي definitely so we we became very desensitized we became very um, vulnerable to the to the pain and um, hurting of others um, so we were wondering if you can talk about a little bit about compassion uh, uh, fatigue versus uh, empathy and especially during emergency situations uh, because we became to, to the point where we are very tired of witnessing the pain of others and not being able to do anything and um, we have all those sayings uh, the Syrian sayings saying stuff like um, I had enough with the pain I can't hear anything anymore uh, my heart is aching with pain uh, please don't don't add to it um so we were wondering if we, if you can elaborate on that well i'm going to uh, i'll try let's start with the what i distinguish between empathy and compassion empathy is very similar to neuroception our bodies react to the pain in others or even the joy in others we react to it the issue is what do we do with that reaction when we see someone in pain? And this is where the fatigue comes in. Compassion is what we do with that neuroception. So if we get triggered by someone's pain and then we get into our interpretation of a compassion one, we want to be there, we want to be present, we want to be helpful and supportive. But if our body is basically saying too much for me, that compassion is no longer available. So it's like uh, we, empathy is more reflexive and the person is saying they don't have the resource to add that compassionate understanding of their body's reaction. And this is really, I mean, we have to be, we have to honor it. We talk about it in, 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 in the US in terms of burnout, in terms of medical care and psychiatric care where the therapist can't anymore. They burn out. And what to me, that is telling me something about how they're delivering care. Because it truly compassion when they it says compassion has a degree of co-regulation built into it. So compassion, that's why some people thrive under the worst situations where they in a sense they can be helpful, but they're not just being helpful, they're getting signals back that are nourishing to them. But mm -hmm. if they are not able to process those signals and are being overwhelmed by literally their empathic reaction, then they can't, uh, they don't serve the purpose that they would like to serve. So they're now 
not sending those positive cues that a presence to the patients that they're working with. Uh, I think we need not to, uh, I'm going to say shame and humiliate people when they are saying, I can't do it anymore. We have mm -hmm. to start understanding that there's a degree of, uh, I'm going to say, self-maintenance or self-compassion mm -hmm. that's needed along the line of offer compassion. And people have asked me what I would do in terms of structuring. I would say that it means that people who are first responders, people who are therapists under the worst of times, need time with their with their colleagues to co-regulate, to play, to to have a cup of coffee, to do something, and not stay under this chronic stress. Even to have humor. So, yeah times to use humor but their bodies need a break from the demands of in a sense how their nervous system is treated it is they have to all they do is give and what i'm trying to say is when you are in the right space physiologically your thing is turning into receiving it's a reciprocal feeling you get of co-regulation and that is really the roots of our own sociality it's not i'm social and you're not I'm accessible mm -hmm. to you, and by being accessible to you, you become accessible to me, and we have this dialogue and feel relationship. And uh, even in the terms of doing therapy or supporting others, whether it is mental health or physical health, that interaction of co-regulation between client and, and therapist, clinician, is always there. We as a patient, and all of us have been patient at times, know the difference. We know the difference between the person who is present with us, look at us, who is basically sharing, or a person who just basically says, take this pill and runs out the room. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Very insightful. And that was like, I, I feel this is one of the importance of working within groups. If you're working in crisis response to co-regulate with that group and to have a laugh about it. And I, and I know personally, Dr. Taysir encourages all the trainees and people working in the field to gather around and talk about it in a humorous way and talk about like um, funny incidents they run into. And he says, this is, this is a healing experience for you yeah yeah yes. i'm looking into the questions and i'm i'm, I'm waiting on shirin she's gonna send me a couple of questions more but okay. if you feel if you want to ask any any more questions uh, uh dr taysir we would love to yeah. talk about it yeah. دكتور ستيف بخبرة صارت معنا خلال العمل مع النساء المعنفات بوحدة الحماية من خلال العمل مع النساء المعنفات وحدة الحماية كان دائما تجينا ملاحظة من العاملات والاختصاصيات بالوحدة لما تدخل السيدة على المركز طبعا هو مركز شلتر يعني للإقامة بالبداية كانت تقريبا كان سلوك نمطي عند كل السيدات انه كانوا يظهروا خضوع مبالغ في لقوانين المكان دون اي مناقشة او اعتراض حتى لو كان على حسابه لاحقا بعد مرور حوالي الشهر هالسيدة نفسها بتبلش تظهر علامات او اظهار سلوك غاضب واعتراض على اي انتهاك لخصوصيتها او احتياجاتها وكان السؤال من العاملات بالمكان نحن عم نرتكب خطا نحن عم نعمل شيء يؤدي لهذا التغير عند السيدات كان جوابي وجواب شيرين معي انه السيده بلشت تشعر بالامان وبلشت تطلع من او تستخدم منصه ثانيه بالبدايه كانت جاي بمنصه الشت داون لاحقا صارت تستخدم منصه الموبلايزيشن فكنا نقول لهم انه هذا بالعكس هذا شيء جيد لانه هي عم تستخدم نافيجيتنج انذر بلاتفورم يعني هي عم تستخدم منصه اخرى وهذا شيء جيد معناتها انتم حسنتوا بيئه الامان وبالتالي صار عندها قدره تستخدم منصه ثانيه حابب اسمع يعني الدكتور ستيفو اذا بيعرف لنا الامان اذا اذا كان ممكن يعني نحصل على تعريف نظري واجرائي للامان. 
Okay, so through clinical observation and through their training, the, the, basically Dr. Taysir and, and their team were, tra were tra giving trainings to um, uh, managers in safe shelters that take gender-based violence women into safe shelters. And the workers over there, they were complaining to Dr. Taysir how the women, when they first uh, come to the shelters, they are very calm, they're very sub sub like they're very submissive. Um, they're um, they're uh, complying to the rules and everything. But after a while, those same women they start presenting with anger bursts, and they were starting to show uh, um, uh, very angry behavior, defiant behaviors. And Dr. Taysir has been explaining this uh, in a in a positive way. He was saying that you are pro providing a safe environment for them to experience those feelings, to move from this immobilization um, platform into the mobilization and helping them. Uh, process their uh, trauma and uh, communicate what's going on inside of them. Uh, so his question was, if you, if you can give us a comment about that, if that's a correct observation, and um, maybe you can give us um, um, an explanation what is safety is. As simple as this definition might be, it's very broad, and you have a very unique definition of, of safety. So Yeah. Yeah, the the answer it's a your explanation is plausible. Uh, I, the the issue is when people are extremely fearful, they're very conscious of what their behaviors are within that environment. And if they start feeling safe, they start expressing space. So they're acting out. We would say the issue is how is resolved with that. How do they then self organize to be a cohesive, uh, interactive group? And that's that's my my realm of expertise. That's that's uh, how people deal with people who are. Uh, it's kind of like dealing with military recruits. I think it's like you trying to now superimpose an order on those who now have experienced control of their own lives. Okay, now do you have a second part of the question? Was what was it? The definition of safety. Oh, what safety. is safety? Yeah. Simple. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's start off by saying that safety is not defined by cultural standards or society. Mm -hmm. Safety mm -hmm. is defined by your body. And what polyvagal theory starts to try to tell you is that when your body is in a state that supports health growth and restoration, meaning homeostatic function, then you have the capacity to feel safe doesn't mean you feel safe but you have the neural substrate to feel safe that feelings of safety are not overt objective exterior features they are really what your body is telling you so that in certain environments someone will say i feel safe and another person is going to be shaking and and you just don't understand what the difference is because they're both experiencing the same physical context but their physiological states are different and we use other terms. We talk about psychological flexibility or autonomic flexibility. We're talking about resilient systems. So when a nervous system has greater resilience, it really can experience feelings of safety in a broader context. Definitely, yes. Very insightful. Uh, do you have any further question, Dr. Taysir, or maybe we can ask Dr. Stephen Porges to give us um, his, it, if you wanted us to ask you a question that didn't come up um, for, for no, you today, I, I, or if you have any message that you wanted to, to give to the clinician? Well, my only message is that there is a real understanding of the uh, experiences on in in very in several areas of the world by many of us that you know that that syria has been under a constant war for years many years and uh the earthquake was really uh, if you want to take away from people a sense of predictability the earthquake is really a, a powerful mechanism and when i went to new zealand they're still dealing with the earthquake that occurred almost 10 years ago on the effects of the children there 
because they had a whole set of sequences that evolved that have a lot to deal with line predictability. And this is part of what you'll see with children as well. So the, the part I want to say is that uh, there are many of us around the world who are extremely concerned about the quality of life of, of our colleagues and of, of our species in different parts mm -hmm. and saying, you know, we, we need to treat people better. And we need to be more understanding that when uh, certain horrible things happen that create a chaos in the nervous system's ability to develop predictable outcomes, that we have mm -hmm. to develop a different way of accepting people and supporting them. And when I went online within days, I was with the Turkish groups on mm -hmm. on a webinar which and it wasn't that i had anything special to say other than i'm here i'm here for you and in a way that's why i'm here with you in syria is that i want you to know that what's going on here affects me greatly and that i want you to know you're not isolated that there are many of us who who, who share these feelings and through the connection that we want to make and we can do some of that virtually but of course, we can do it better if we go, you know, see each other. But the idea is that there are a lot of people in this world who want the world to be a better place and see the vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities are really something as simple as our bodies don't know how to trust people anymore. And our bodies want to trust. And that, I think, is the optimistic story. When I walked into the world of trauma, I learned what it was really to be a human being. Because the people who are experiencing trauma told me what they wanted and what they couldn't do. What they wanted was to be safe in the arms of another, but their bodies would not let them do that. Definitely. And How once I, I understood, once I understood that, I understood mm -hmm. what it was now to be. It was to feel safe in the arms of another. I was saying, I love. What is it, Dr. Taysir? I'm sorry. The, the power of love. The power of yes. love, definitely. Yes, yes, yes. Def if we have uh, time just for one last question and then we're, we're going to ask you for some resources, some recommendations. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. yes. يعني كفرونت لاينرز بالزلزال وكيف ممكن نحن نستفيد او كيف ممكن نفهم الاسعاف النفسي الاولي انفورمد باي بوليفيجال ثيوري يعني كيف انا بدي اعزز الاسعاف النفسي الاولي اللي, اللي ممكن نعمله للاشخاص وخاصه اللي عاملين ديسوسيشن في اثناء الزلزال كان هذا السؤال من اكثر الاسئله تكرارا اذا معنا وقت يعني كثير بنكون ممنونين ل Dr. Steve If we have time to answer this one last question, because we have been getting a lot of questions about how can we integrate polyvagal into the psychological first aid, and especially with people who resorted to shut down, how can we get mm. them out of this state? Okay, the, the first thing is the, the polyvagal theory, the most important thing to take, take home with you is that people are broadcast physiological state in their voice and in their face and in their gestures and we need to respect that now if you're shut down or they are in a sense behavior is minimized and they're withdrawn or dissociative there are strategies of really providing use of safety and it starts off by merely being present with another person uh, it doesn't mean making direct eye contact it may being next to them, enabling them. It may you may want to use uh, horses or dogs that that people may find safer to be with than other people. So the issue is uh, pets are very helpful in bridging the strategy of allowing people to feel safe. The term I use safe enough with another mammal, not necessarily human, but another mammal, and and often like dogs even cats and horses at times are more sensitive to the physiological states of other humans than humans are. 
Definitely. It's, it's kind of remarkable about what a good why pets are so valuable because they live not through words, although they may vocalize, they live through neuroception. They're detecting their surveillance system of their owner's bodies. So Definitely. the issue is, I think, a respect for the behavior that people are in. I think there are, again, historical and cultural histories here about how to bring people out of it. I, I think the models of what you were describing earlier, like grieving, grieving is a shutting down response. And how is grieving treated in, in Islamic culture was basically with people being there and food. Uh, it, it's And I think we need to say, what is grieving but a time of trauma? So how do we bring people out of grief? They give us hints of how to bring them out of trauma. And that is, you, you, when you're getting, grieving, you don't tell people you shouldn't grieve, get over it. You shouldn't, and you should treat trauma in the same way. Trauma is an experience that the body has to resolve. And it doesn't resolve by telling it to resolve it. It needs to know that it's safe enough in the context for it to resolve itself. And that's, that's where the group's socialization, playfulness, uh, support come in. Definitely, definitely very insightful. And the, the proof of that in Syria, we have been witnessing increased adoption of pets, dogs and cats uh, because ah. people have that co-regulatory um, presence and mammals in their lives, definitely. Um, yeah. Can you give us uh, recommendations on, I, I, we would love to go on and on, but we don't want to take too much of, out of your time. Uh, can you please give us some recommendation or resources, readings, books yeah. for yeah. us and for our audience today? Uh, sure. To begin uh, with yeah, you will send me an email and send you a packet of papers, including one on sociality, one on appeasement, uh, one on um, uh, so the, the vagal paradox and one on safety and then what i was going to mention was to those who want to read something easy or easier my son and i wrote a book it's coming out at the end of september called our polyvagal world and it's not a book written for therapists and scientists it's it's written for everyone um and hopefully we'll get it translated into arabic so that it will be easier yeah for for your client i think it's a book that a therapist should give their clients to read because it shifts the model from you got to do something to you got to you have to listen basically listen to your own body you have to respect it and then when you respect it you learn from it and when you learn from it you learn how to navigate in this world Definitely. So looking forward to reading this book. Um, can I give the words of thanks, Dr. Taysir, or do you want to give them for you? Thank نحتاجها في أوقات شدة نحن للأسف لازلنا بأوقات الشدة ممكن يعني نحتاج لقامة علمية كبيرة مثل الدكتور ستيف. We are beyond thankful for your dedication, uh, some of your valuable time. We understand how busy your schedule is uh, to be with us in this very informative, informative uh, webinar for you to share your uh, knowledge uh, with us. And we are hoping for more interviews, um, hopefully in the future, to benefit from this uh, great wealth of knowledge of yours and its application in the Syrian world. So we're beyond honored and grateful. Thank you. So so much dr stephen porges well thank you so much for welcoming me into your community and i certainly hope that we build a strong bridge to bring polyvagal practices throughout syria so, hopefully hopefully thank you. thank you so much thank you thank you we're grateful and uh, w last words of thank you, thanks is for Shireen Khalil who's beyond the stage uh, who helped preparing all those questions uh -huh. and uh, 
Um, she was uh, an essential part of it. I would like to extend my thanks to Majd Zakia, the president founder of the Syrian Professional Network, and Mohammed Rahmani, who is the technician with us today, and to Chanti. Please hi, say hi to Chanti because without Chanti, we, we couldn't uh, coordinate this uh, webinar together. And the last thank you for you, Dr. Stephen Portress. Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your day, and thank you for all the information you shared with us today. Thank you. Don't forget to send me an email so I can send materials back. We will, Thank for you. sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.